right. Well, I think we have a lot to cover, so we should get started. Yeah. Okay. I can. I can definitely get started. If you if you think it's time, we can do it, and we'll people will yep. trickle in anyway. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So ready to go? Yeah. Okay. So let's get this party started, guys. So I'm gonna. So just kind of the quick agenda. I'll I'll go ahead and get it started. Kick it off, uh, and then. Um, I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves uh, once I get the, the kickoff done, and then we'll turn it over to Laura. And uh, let's keep it. Let's keep the chat alive. Uh, Q and A. If you have questions, let's you know let's put it in there. I think it's important. Uh, let's make this fun. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I want to start by saying good afternoon, good morning to some who are maybe coming in from the West Coast. And uh, for those who are dialing in from Europe, I know we had a few registrants from Europe uh, and, and Far East. So good evening to, to those attendees there. Um, thanking everyone, attendees, panelists for being here today. I know uh, we're taking time out of our day to, to do this. Uh, let's make it fun. Uh, let's make it beneficial. I think that's really one of the objectives here is to make it beneficial for the, uh, the individuals who are going to be listening in, uh, whether it's going to be on a live session or a recorded session. I think what we want is to... Um, uh, what we want here is to basically, you know, create some interaction. And if we can prevent a cyber attack, if we can literally prevent one or maybe reassure somebody that they're doing the right thing, uh, then let's go ahead. And, you know, I think that that's already a big, a big accomplishment. Uh, so myself, I'll do a quick intro. I'm Luigi Tiano. I represent Assurance IT uh, based in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, we are a... Um, we call ourselves a data protection, business continuity, uh, cybersecurity outfit. Uh, we help companies of all sizes, small, medium, large, uh, protect themselves from a cyber disaster. Um, and uh, today I have the, the honor and the privilege of being side by side with these individuals you see on the screen here. Um, I can't do them justice, so I'll let them introduce themselves in a short while. Uh, great accomplishments, uh, truly great credentials, so I'll let them um, I'll let them introduce themselves in a little bit. Um, Laura Bernard, uh, she's going to be the moderator of this event. She's uh, a digital marketing expert, a famous podcaster. I know she doesn't like when I call her famous, but she is. Um, she's going to have the job of keeping us all aligned. Uh, we're going to be talking about some amazing uh, topics today. We're all very passionate, as you will learn. So we kind of get ahead of ourselves sometimes. So Laura is going to be there keeping us all aligned and on track because we want to make this conversation optimal. Um, and uh, for the attendees, just so you know, maybe you can't see this, maybe you can, but uh, we're giving away a tablet to the person, the individual who's going to be the most interactive or most engaged. So answer some, or some you know, Q&A later on in, in the session. Uh, be sure to, to, um, to write us up. The person who basically most engaged will win. Um, you may have to answer a skill testing question. So please pay attention. We just can't give away stuff for free here for, you know, we've got the, we've got the, you know, really high, really high bar here. So Julien already has a question. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's the giveaway. And uh, before I turn it over to the panelists, I just want to say why we did this event, right? Because I mean, why did we take the time out of our day why do we ask you to take time out of your day uh, to be here with us, right? So as I said earlier, I have the luxury of speaking to some of these individuals on a regular basis um, about cybersecurity, cyber attacks, uh, and let's face it, um, it's no secret. The cyber attacks, the scope, the magnitude, the impact of the, of the attacks that we are seeing today in today's world are like never before. And uh, what we want to do here, like I said today, is basically um, bring a few stories to you uh, through a, a discussion, open dialogue, um, basically, you know, raise the, the awareness bar, let you know what's out there, the anatomy of an attack, um, how you can better protect yourself, uh, what's in it for you as an organization to, to do so. Um, and look, you know, cybersecurity, cyber uh, attacks have become mainstream. The news is picking them up on a daily basis. These are no longer anomalies. I mean, you know, you would, once upon a time, you would hear about an attack that would happen, you know, once every six months at a company. These are daily occurrences. Uh, large organizations are being impacted. We are being impacted at the individual level. We, we are being impacted as a society, as a whole. And today, we hope the discussion uh, really sparks some interest and some thought-provoking uh, you know, thoughts for you. Now, before I turn it over, there's one last important note that I want to bring to light is we often think about a cyber security initiative or cyber attack in a very technological way. That is true. 
However, there's another aspect of it, which we sometimes forget, um, which essentially is the, the legal and the risk management perspective of things, right? Uh, we often forget about the legal implications of hosting somebody's data, the personal information, the privacy laws that are associated with that, um, the sensitivity of the data that's, that's being put out there, all the legislation that goes hand in hand with you as an organization to be able to host and, and protect one's data. Uh, also, the, the cyber insurance, what can cyber insurance offer you? What can it do? What it, what it can't do for you? And we have some individuals on the panel as well today who are going to talk and answer some questions regarding that. So that's it from my perspective on the intro. I'll call upon each of the panelists for a quick intro of themselves, and then I'll, I'll flip it over to Laura and she can go ahead and get started. Does that work? So I'll start with Vanessa. Vanessa, maybe just a quick intro on yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. So hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. I'm very happy. So my name is Vanessa Deschain. I'm a partner lawyer at Rubik. So um, mainly I advise companies um, either on the public or private sector regarding privacy uh, matters. So the legal aspect of it. So whether how to be compliant, how to implement a privacy program. So sometimes it's going to be draft policies, procedures, um, helping a clients uh, determine if there's a notification, if there's a privacy breach. So what to do? Do you need to notify a, a privacy commissioners, individuals? So um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. Perfect. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, Julien, how about yourself? Yes, hello, good afternoon. And uh, my name is Julien Turco. I'm a VP of Business Partnership at GoSecure. I've been in uh, cybersecurity for almost like uh, 20 years-ish. And uh, I must say it's, um, it's, it's very a good thing to see that now everyone is understanding what cybersecurity is, which is five years ago. It wasn't easy to explain to everyone and trying to uh, like preaching in a desert, as we say, uh, talking about cybersecurity. So I'm very glad to be here and thanks for, uh, for having me today. Thank you, Julien. Thank you for your time again. David Leonard? Yes, hello. Thank you so much for uh, putting this on. I'm very happy to, to join the panel discussion today. Um, my name is David Leonard. Uh, I'm responsible for the cyber insurance uh, portfolio at EGR. EGR is an uh, insurance brokerage firm based in Quebec. Uh, but we're licensed across Canada. And we have uh, five offices across uh, the principal areas of Quebec. Uh, I joined the team about two years ago. I uh, came from the underwriting side, uh, specifically at Chubb and AIG, uh, underwriting for, uh, um, professional liability and cyber insurance. And then prior to getting into uh, insurance altogether. I worked in treasury at SNC Lavalin. Uh, don't have any uh, IT technical background, uh, but I have worked towards uh, obtaining that. I recently completed a program through the Carnegie Mellon University, and which has helped facilitate more technical understanding. But uh, my main role is really to help quantify and, and quantify um, the risk and put in place a risk transfer uh, solution, uh, be it a cyber insurance policy for our clients. Thank you, David. Last but not least, David Millet. Thank you, Luigi. Um, Dave Millet. I'm a Chief Technology Evangelist and co-founder of SQA Logic. Uh, we've been in operation now for eight years, uh, based out of Montreal as well. We have uh, operations and business pretty much around the world. We do work in the US, Europe, uh, <laughs> South Africa, down in South America. Um, we specialize in quality assurance testing, be that functional performance or security and um, you know, have customers um, of all sizes, basically from small to medium business all the way up to very large organizations uh, and helping them uh, determine their strategy and implement uh, tools and practices to mitigate risk and uh, get more value out of their applications. Fantastic. I told you I wasn't lying. Got some amazing people on the phone here on the, on the line. Laura, it's up to you now. You got it, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Now is when the party's really starting, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> I had no doubt. I had no doubt. Okay. So, so everyone knows I really want to encourage everybody 
to participate in the chat. So I want to ask everyone a question. What story or what cyber attack are you most interested in learning about? We do have a specific order we're going in, but if you guys like a specific story or want to know more about a specific story, okay, we have Anne-Marie, she said CRA. Oh, even Cameron, CRA, thank you, thank you. So while you guys are pooling that in, oh, Colonial Pipeline. Okay, so we have a lot of interest in CRA and Colonial Pipeline, which is ironic because we're starting with Bombardier. Woo! <laughs> so we're going to start with Bombardier and for every single story, I'm just going to read out like five points about the cyber attack so that we're all on the same page and that we know what's going on. And then I'm going to start asking questions to the panelists here. So five facts. Number one, earlier this year, Bombardier suffered a cybersecurity breach. We know that much. Two, the company acknowledged the attack after some of its data surfaced on a hacker's web portal. Three, confidential information relating to employees, customers, and suppliers were compromised, and the manufacturing and customer support operations have not been impacted or interrupted. Four, an initial investigation revealed that the hackers accessed and extracted data by exploiting a vulnerability affecting a third-party file transfer application. Many security experts think the attack is part of the, I always say this wrong, so I apologize, Excelion, get it? Excelion supply chain breach. Excelion has urged its customers to migrate away from the vulnerable FTA web server that appears to have resulted in 100 companies being attacked and data stolen from 25 of them thus far. So that's our little summary from for Bombardier. And my first question is going to go to David Millet. So legacy applications seem to pose a huge threat when it comes to protecting the enterprise. With so many large corporations having a notoriously difficult time upgrading and keeping up to date with applications, how can corporations fast track themselves to safety? And is this even possible? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, the reality is, is that when you look at um, uh, the complexity of the infrastructures that exist today, so organizations in the past had very uh, monolithic sort of uh, applications that were to put in place, mainframes and a couple of client server type, type applications that would connect. And, um, you know, then with the arrival of uh, from 1995 onwards, the Internet started booming and things started changing and uh, interoperability and, and uh, you know, connected systems via the Internet started happening. And, you know, microservices and everything that we know that is the world today with the cloud uh, coming into play uh, opened up the, the fact that even though you had your, your organization had uh, its own systems, uh, it became more and more critical to uh, interact and uh, tie these systems to external uh, environments. And with that naturally comes risk. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, in, in the case of this particular uh, breach, we're talking about uh, a system that was uh, acquired and used uh, to store uh, shared files and information with the customers and, and uh, with their, their uh, individuals. So it kind of had a limitation on what was leaked because it was it was uh, held within one specific area and not necessarily connected to the internal systems. Um, but, you know, whatever was on that system could have been better controlled as far as what's allowed to be shared and what's the expiration on shared dates and, and uh, monitoring of those systems, right? Um, in the case of this attack, um, it's unfortunate. It was a, a zero-day breach um, and, and a problem that happened within the system that allowed hackers to get into that system and you know, steal information from not just Bombardier, but a lot of other organizations, as you mentioned. Um, so it's important to stay uh, abreast and aware of uh, these zero day attacks. Um, there's also systems that can be put in place to protect against that, be it, uh, you know, web access firewalls and things of that nature that will sort of mitigate attacks when zero days, uh, you know, vulnerabilities are identified. Um, you know, I, I often say that whatever human beings put together as a vault to protect themselves, <laughs> there's always people that are going to attack that vault. So you have to always be on the lookout and evolving uh, your methodology and the tools that you use to defend against those different things. And uh, I guess I'll leave it at that because we've got a lot of other topics to, to go into. So don't want to steal the thunder of everybody over here. <laughs> I see that Julien has something to add to it. But just before we get to Julien, you said zero day attack. Can you just explain what that is for people in the audience? Well, yeah, a zero day vulnerability. 
basically what that means is it's a vulnerability that's identified in the wild that's that's new that's not necessarily defended against and um, it's brought to light often by ethical hackers or things of that nature that bring them to light and say there's a problem over here um, and unfortunately when that happens it, it, it's good because it allows the organizations to start creating patches and fixing against that but the zero day vulnerability often doesn't have a physical patch yet available in the software to fix it so but that means that it implies that you either got to close down the system defend yourself against it put up uh you know uh, guard doors or firewalls or so forth around that because the vulnerability is not uh, patched until the organization has the ability to go ahead and fix it right so you'll hear a lot of zero day vulnerabilities around bias and uh, you know operating systems and so forth that's the reason that we have security patch updates from windows that annoy us all once a month if not once a week um, I know they're annoying, but they're important to do because that's exactly how hackers get in, right? It's when we don't update our systems that we leave all these doors open. And unfortunately, it's often through these, these little things that they get in and then they, they're able to navigate our, our systems and um, you know, cause damage. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. And if anyone else has any more questions, um, just be sure to, when you're writing in the chat, to write to the panelists and the attendees so that everyone can see your questions. Julien, you had something to add? Yeah, well, um, thank you, David, for the, uh, the zero day explanation. It's, it's uh, in that case, what is, and, and uh, on, on my end, I call this unfinished uh, software. Let's say most of the time they have to release the software, let's say Microsoft or Oracle or these big guys. And uh, it's, it's not time sensitive, but because of the investor in the back end, they want to push the release and the software quickly. So that's where happened the zero day. But in that case, the Acelian FTA, which stands for File Transfer Services, um, was 20 years old technology. So to find a zero day, <laughs> In that kind of stuff, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's it's a interesting fact that that's what I wanted to add. That's great. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the zero. You're you're right in the fact that the, you know organizations are under pressure to release software faster. But the the other notion of a zero day is that you know, um, like for example, every week there's zero day vulnerabilities that are uncovered, right? Because although you know, as a tester, our goal is often to test everything that we can. Um, you know, we could test forever and still continue to find potential bugs and anomalies and problems within the software or, or, or certain vulnerabilities that are uncovered through new methodologies or approaches that are used to get in, right? Whether that's uh, DDoS attacks or, you know, putting a system under stress to find a weakness or so forth. That's, that's the, you know, that's, the, that's the challenge, right? As, as much as we put up walls to defend against ourselves, as much as the attackers are challenged by those walls, to want to find a way to get around them, under them, over them, you know, and into our systems. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's funny because you don't necessarily need to be a very big organization to be under potential threat right now, right? There's, there's um, organizations of all sizes that are, you know, held for ransomware, things of that nature that are often, you look and you dig in, there's often two root causes, right? It's either an individual maliciously or often just by not knowing that he's communicating with somebody that he shouldn't that's sharing information or providing things that could cause a problem or in, in a lot of cases it's, it's a mispatched system or you know misupdated firmware on something that, that that is being leveraged by the hackers to get in by a side door that was unfortunately not closed right once the zero day vulnerability has been addressed I think that's super important to mention how people can get in because that's what people can focus on. And you mentioned three of them. So thank you for that. So if anyone has questions for David or Julien who's talked so far, just let us know in the chat. But right now I also, I wanna shift gears here. And Vanessa, you might have to help me. <laughs> so before I ask you this question, can you define Pipetta? Did I get it? Oh yeah. And uh, CPPA. Act. What are they? And uh, and then I'm going to ask you my question. Yeah, for sure. Maybe I'm just going to go back a little bit to be sure that we're all on the same page. So maybe a crash course uh, um, regarding to how law works in Canada. So as you may know, because of our constitution, uh, so the parliament can uh, legislate on a federal level or provincial level, right? So regarding privacy, uh, there's privacy laws at a federal level because of the commercial activities, which is 
regarding to the constitution under uh, federal um, rights to legislate. And we can also have privacy legislation on a provincial level because of the civil rights, which uh, pertains to uh, provincial level. Okay, so in Canada, we're having privacy laws at a federal level and at a provincial level. So PIPETA is the federal law for the private sector, because uh, again, there's law uh, in the private sector, and then you also have privacy laws for the public sector. Uh, so PIPEDA is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. <laughs> uh, so uh, basically, it's the privacy law uh, that will uh, give uh, guidance and requirements for the private sector uh, that are within the scope of this uh, legislation. So mainly all the provinces except Quebec, Alberta and BC will be subject to PIPEDA. Uh, in the private sector. And CPPA stands for Consumer Privacy Protection Act, uh, but it's not uh, a law at the moment. We, you probably heard about the Bill C-11. So uh, eventually Bill C-11, so CPPA will replace PIPEDA. So I don't know if it answered the question, but... <laughs> no, that was a great breakdown for everybody. Now we... We're all professionals here in PIPEDA. Oh man, I keep saying it wrong. <laughs> anyway, so what I want to address is that in this situation from Bombardier, enterprise, employee, and supplier, and customer data were stolen. So does that mean that PIPEDA and now CPPA are in effect here or, or not? <laughs> um. Okay, so uh, again, CPPA uh, is not uh, a law at the moment, so it's gonna be uh, PIPEDA. Um, if we're talking about Bombardier, so depending on where the data comes from, so if you have data from uh, people from Quebec, from uh, Ontario, from BC, from Alberta, uh, then you're gonna have different privacy laws applying to that specific case. Uh, so PIPETA will be um, the law to look to if there's um, personal information uh, from people from Ontario, um, New Brunswick, other provinces where they don't have their uh, specific privacy law. And uh, you need to keep in mind that privacy laws will apply only to personal information. So if there's other type of data that uh, don't qualify as personal information, then it's out of scope of uh, PIPEDA. That's very interesting. Only personal information. So anything related to company information is not protected under this? Uh, not under PIPEDA. Okay, okay, perfect. No. So it's so really personal information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anything related to an individual. So, you know, names, uh, I mean, the definition is very broad. So anything that can um, permit you to identify someone directly or indirectly um, is uh, what we call personal information. Mm -hmm. So just uh, a follow-up question here. In this case, they only came out with a statement once the data and all this information was found on the, on the web. So is Bombardier legally obligated to inform the company stakeholders that this happened, that there was a breach and that information did get stolen? Uh, I would say that it depends. So it depends if there is a mandatory notification, uh, if there is a privacy breach. At the moment, there's only a mandatory notification obligation if you're um, covered by uh, PIPEDA, uh, BC, uh, no, not BC, I think uh, federal and Alberta. So there's only uh, two privacy laws in Canada that have that uh, obligation to notify. So if you have a breach, let, for example, the Bombardier one, you need to uh, see where are your data? Like, is it data from Ontarians people, from uh, Quebec people? And then you need to look at the privacy law. Do you have uh, an obligation for that? 
So that's one thing. Then you may have agreements with other stakeholders, partners, even if it's not the law uh, in your agreement, you could say that, you know, if you're subject to a privacy breach or to a breach, you need to notify that partner. Uh, so that's also something you need to keep in mind. Super important for everyone in this chat right now. And we also have a question from the attendees from Anne-Marie. She said, what if you collect data from outside of Canada? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Then you need to assess uh, what are the other privacy laws. So you probably heard about GDPR, which is the the law in Europe, there's also uh, privacy laws around the world, you know, in like China, in South America and Brazil. So you really need to know what data uh, was breached uh, from which country and then to determine what are the legal requirements, uh, etc. Okay, so it really determines on if you're end user, it depends on whatever country they're in, not necessarily where you're in. Exactly. Super important. Okay, awesome. So I just want to, I want to ask Dav, uh, David Leonard, in this case for Bombardi, would the insurance have responded? Yeah, I think <clears throat> Vanessa raised some very, uh, as well as David, into some important points and some key takeaways. And I'll kind of uh, correlate that to the insurance uh, world in terms of how the risk transfer takes place. Um, Historically, I think what we've seen is that, um, again, the number of breaches we don't see, we've seen now really an evolution of what can be covered under insurance policy. Um, and I'll just highlight quickly what it is, and I'll come back to certain points throughout our discussion throughout this afternoon. But really, the insurance policy there is to respond. One, uh, we look at it in three kind of sec uh, portions. One, there's the element of the crisis management. So the onset uh, it brings forth the uh, team, covers the cost for the team to come manage the, uh, the incident. Uh, and with what Danessa points out is that if we do see an element of data that's personal or data that has been exfiltrated, you know, one of the first callers, what you'd be want to be touching base with her to see what, from a regulatory standpoint, what you're liable for uh, and help mitigate that. And then calling on for Julian and David to come in and to any investigative work to determine really what was affected what do we do to mitigate this breach, kind of uh, reduce that exposure? And that whole element there is kind of falls within the crisis management. Then there's the direct damages that occur, so potentially loss of revenue. Uh, if there's an element of an extortion, restoration of data, those costs there are also covered by uh, the reimbursable on an insurance policy. And all this work is really done to try and mitigate the liability portion of it. And that's where um, Vanessa is suggesting that, you know, we're starting to see specifically in Canada, that we're seeing starting to see some strict rules starting to fall with GDPR from that aspect. And these elements are also recoverable on an insurance policy, one, to defend these allegations, uh, and uh, as well as if there's any fines or penalties that are imposed. I think uh, there's some key also takeaways from the Bavardia case. Uh, one, it talks about the supply chain. I think there is also, we talk about now regulatory standpoint and a legislation, but there's also others that are still in force. Uh, for instance, uh, Bombardier uh, uh, is also um, a defense manufacturer. Uh, so the Department of Defense in the U.S. has strict guidelines now in terms of what protocol and what tools are implemented to mitigate those controls. At the same time, looking down the whole supply chain, just to the, the individual manufacturer, small mom and pop shop that is manufacturing the, uh, the nuts and bolts that are end up on a, on a defense vehicle, uh, there's regulation that could be imposed on that. And so we've really seen an evolution on that aspect. And I think that's something to really take in consideration is that, yes, you are also vulnerable as an organization, but also who you're doing business with. And that's where I think Vanessa also raised that we're starting to see this kind of element of uh, what happens now in contracts and say, well, what happens if you incur a breach? When are you going to notify me? At what point do you notify me? And I think that's there as well as in terms of that. The legal aspect comes to play in terms of Vanessa, but also the insurance team from with respect to putting together uh, the team that's going to help you notify how we're going to notify that really to reduce the potential damages from a liability aspect. Thank you, David. So I actually have a question from the audience. It's, it's a little bit lengthy, so I'm, I'm going to read it out to you. Are insurance underwriters beginning to insist that tools and policies are followed by the insured companies? 
Example, insisting on multiple factor authentication, documented patching and update policies, implementation of security tools, et cetera. Or in other words, are we going to be seeing more insurance companies deny claims if they don't feel the company took appropriate steps to prevent the breach? Did the breach at Bombardier have ITAR ramifications? No, that's a separate question. That's a oh. separate question. Yeah, that was a separate one. I can answer the first one. Uh, it's lengthy, but it's, it's a really good and it's a good uh, one. very topical question that we're starting to see. Uh, and I'm, I'm able to give you uh, a perspective from coming from the underwriting side, but as well as now on the brokerage side in terms of uh, you know, direct access to client and how we put together uh, an underwriting proposal and, a risk and looking and evaluate the solutions that we're able to obtain from the various markets. From an underwriting standpoint, uh, we're, I think historically it's nothing new in terms of a coverage. What we've seen is the evolution in terms of the very competitive markets. So underwriting guidelines became very lax. Uh, just because a lot of new markets wanted to get into it, build a book of business, a portfolio. Uh, but now we start to see that the claims are starting to ramp up. And now we start seeing back underwriting questions to be as strict as they were, you know, 10 years ago when this kind of, uh, and from that standpoint, when we were starting offering this more on a monoline basis. Um, historically, uh, cyber insurance kind of falls more for technology driven companies. And now it's pretty much, as we can see, organizations uh, from healthcare down to, uh, a manufacturer of widgets, uh, it can be affected. Um, that said, I don't think we're at a scenario in time where we're start seeing denial of claims. Uh, that's always a concern. That's always, again, speaking with who is your, your, your broker in terms of choice of carrier, uh, that all comes to a play in terms of that confidence. I always welcome the idea with clients that they, uh, they, there is kind of a, an onboarding call with the underwriter as well as the, the client uh, to go through these kind of questions. Um, but what I would say is that we start seeing now certain language associated with um, because at the end of the day, the, the risk transfer solution really comprises of completing an application, which is essentially a balance sheet in time. But we can say that, yeah, my system is updated today, but what about three months from now? And I didn't do my past sequence. I didn't do this uh, cadence and all that and find out that there was, in fact, a vulnerability. We're starting to see some carriers to start put more exclusionary language around that. So if you didn't do the necessary to support your systems throughout, or you knew that you had a legacy system, but you knew it, but why didn't you make sure that it was not online? And, and I think that comes down to, um, you know, the work of David and Julia in terms of when they're communicating with their clients is, you know, making sure that you have a repertoire of all your, your you know, from your laptops to the software you're using, when, what's the cadence? And that comes down to it. So I think... You know, I don't think we're at a scenario where we're starting to see denial of claims. I think we'll see some tighter underwriting, but also we're starting to see in terms of underwriters starting to pull back on the amount of capacity that they're willing to offer, uh, so the amount of limits, as well as uh, playing around with certain language around it in the policy. So I think it's important. You know, it's never fun to read these type of policies, but uh, to definitely reach out to go through that, uh, it's something to look at uh, closely. Thank you, David, for that, res that response. And thank you, F Peter, for that question. We have David Millet, who also wants to contribute to this question before you get to the second question. So David, all yours. Yeah, so I just wanted to add um, that um, as, as a provider of services in the space to various companies, I can tell you that at least in two key industries, uh, being energy as well as financials, we are being asked to produce our um, disaster recovery and our security uh, measures that are, are you know, being taken from our perspective as far as how we handle their data and how we treat things with regards to when we actively engage with production systems that have sensitive data, right? Um, you, know, you know, do background checks to ensure, you know, that uh, all data is, is segregated and destroyed, you know, upon no longer being required, things of that nature, right? So, you know, this is more and more becoming a practice where, you know, when you bring in third party consultants and you're working with these organizations, that there's a necessity to, you know, also vet and ensure that, you know, whatever you're taking as precautions within your organization, you're doing the same towards the organizations that you engage with and work with. Um, and, and in fact, in certain cases, um, from an insurance perspective, we've had some of the major players that we do business with ask to have their names underwritten under the contracts that we're doing in case of something happening. So have a pass through to cover them under things that we're doing. So there, there's more and more of these types of things that we're seeing. But like uh, David uh, Leonard was saying, it's an, it's an evolving sort of 
market and things are, are changing right now. There's a lot of new things that are coming to light, but I would definitely keep an eye on that because, um, you know, it, it's, it is uh, in fluctuation, let's say. That's great additional info. Thank you, David. And Vanessa, you also want to contribute? Yeah, if I may add, so it, it is going to be a legal requirement to demonstrate compliance. Uh, Bill 64, uh, so the, the new legislation that is going to come uh, soon, I suppose, into force in Quebec regarding privacy. There's specific um, legal requirements that says that you have to implement those policies, procedures, and stuff like that. And if you don't, there's going to be a very uh, big fines. And we, we're talking about potential millions of dollars. So you're going to have to do it <laughs> if you want to be compliant, you know, and manage your, your risks. Yeah, that's crazy and super important. Thank you, Vanessa. Also, as we're talking about stuff, uh, Louis is just adding some links for all the attendees if you want more information about what we're talking about. So thank you, Louis, for that. And Peter asked a second question. So did the breach at Bombardier have ITAR ramifications? Now, personally, I didn't put that in the summary. Does anybody on the panel have additional information about this? And we might not know, right? So. Peter, for this one, we are not sure. We would have to look into it, but if anything, uh, we can email you afterwards and we can have that discussion. So just wrapping up Bombardier, does anyone have any last questions about Bombardier? If not, we're gonna go to the CRA and everyone's excited about that one. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm just gonna do five facts about the CRA. So last year, the CRA reported on several occasions that accounts, um, were compromised. 100,000 users were blocked out of their accounts without providing, and they didn't provide any details of what was happening. They got breached again this year. And after this happened, um, account users were given the option to add two-factor authentication to protect their accounts. This was an option. This year, uh, they were hacked again, and CRA officials referred to one attack as credential stuffing, but the lack of details provided by the CRA leave a lot of unanswered questions. So I think in this discussion, we're gonna be kind of hypothesizing of what we think happened. And the first question I have is for Julien. Julien, are you excited? It's, <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready. So, <laughs> so it seems that password stuffing is a low level attack method. Would having users simply create a more complex password or use different ones across platforms curb the risk of attack? Would that have made a difference in the situation? So the answer is yes. Although <laughs> for the sake of the discussion, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit because um, Password is kind of the oldest technique of, you know, defense as per se. And it's referred to the old school, you know, opening the door, what's the password? And you say your, your password. It's, it's kind of very old and, and very not strong at all. So um, having a, a, a not complex password is a problem, but having a pa to, to only use a password is a bigger problem from, from what I think. And just interesting fact, in Quebec, the most used password is Soleil 1, 2, 3, which, which stands for Sun 123 in English. And this is statistic that we have because at Boosaker, we're doing tons of pen tests and ethical hacking engagement. And we see the kind of um, uh, password that people use. And this is sad, but true. So that's one thing. Pass password is, is an old technique that should not be the only one to defend um, in, in, in infrastructure. So, um, and then we always think that having complex stuff like having a special character will make it stronger. Well, that's not true. <laughs> what is interesting is the number of position in the password is way more important than the complexity of the character that you have. So, and this is basic mathematic. It's, it's exponential where each time you had a position, you made it more complex. So what we say when we're doing kind of awareness with clients and customers, we say, 
you should have a passphrase instead of a, a password because a word is very small where a phrase is very long. And so it could be like, for example, the Smurf are dancing under the sun while, while it's raining. That could be a very strong password without any special character. But this could take like forever for hackers to, um, to crack. And, and by the way, you use the, the, the password stuffing, but what we hear more is password spraying, where we're shooting everywhere with everything and, and roaming between and, and doing like, you know, if, if we're trying all the time the same account with different password, it, it will be luck. So what we do instead, we, we being the adversary, let's say what the adversary we would do is he will try one password to every account in the enterprise one by one. And then the second password with all of the account, that way he doesn't get caught by a system that will see that he's trying to do five times the same account, right? So this is password spraying. So the best strategy is multi-factor authentication, which stands for 2FA, MFA, different password, different buzzword. And, and yes, I know it's annoying receiving a text with the numbers that you need to get in, but this is what you know and, um, and the information you know and the information you have. So this is a, a strong authentication. So uh, the, the, the the recommendation is to have 2FA everywhere as much as possible. And everything that, that, that will offer you like Google, Microsoft, they all and Apple. Apple, I think it's forced by design. You don't even have choice. You have to, to have 2FA on everything. So that is absolutely the best defense <laughs> to, and, and, and it's very inexpensive um, and, and it's very efficient, let's say. Thank you, Julien. Now I have to go change all my passwords. It's fine, fine, guys. <laughs> uh, Louis, you want to add something? Yeah, no, obviously now David Leonard knows my password. I got to change mine as well. Um, <laughs> so, so let me just kind of flip the question here, and I don't want to get in, in Laura's way here, but, but with an organization like CRA, right, we're talking about um, including multi-factor authentication. Now, does that become a very complex thing to do given the size of that organization, right? I mean, the, for, for me, and maybe Julian, you have the answer, but or maybe you don't, but given the complexity and, you know, does that become even feasible that an organization that size can implement a standard multi-factor authentication in a feasible time period? Well, it, 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 used, it used to be not easy because of the old, you know, physical token you have to deploy everywhere to everyone. Right. But now... Everything is cloud, everything is, is virtual, and you have the soft token, and all those companies that I won't name, but we all know them, that they does that kind of, they adapt. Now, they know that if it's too complex to deploy, people won't uh, use them, and the adoption is very important. So, nowadays, it's very easy to deploy quickly, fast, and um, you don't even have to install an agent or whatever it's all pushed by one console so yes to, to your question it is very feasible for any size of company it's not because you're larger that it's more complex for sure you'll you'll have more complexity while deploying with the architecture and everything but is it more expensive not to do it like you know <laughs> so yeah i agree in the news and uh, all, all those problems that comes with it so yeah Great question, Louis. Thank you for adding that. Um, my next question is kind of on the same wavelength and just going back to Vanessa. In this case, the CRA, you know, part of the government, they're also implementing all of the new laws and stuff. How is this possible? Well, that's kind of a rhetoric question. We have no idea. But do these new laws apply to the government? And is the government responsible for being more transparent with all that is happening with these breaches? Well, I mean, they're definitely responsible to be transparent. And transparency is actually one of the 10 privacy principles that are based uh, and that are embedded into our privacy laws. 
um, for the private or public sector. Uh, that being said, um, you know, sometimes people ask, or is it illegal, you know, not to uh, inform uh, the customers or stakeholders? Um, in that specific case, as I mentioned, uh, the CRA is a government agency, so they're not covered by uh, PAPIRA, but they're covered by uh, the, um, I think it's called Access to Information Act, I'm not sure, but for the public sector. And right now, the public sector doesn't have a mandatory notification requirement. So legally, like they don't have to, that being said, there is a policy that was implemented by, I think it was the Treasury Board um, in 2014. And uh, it's a policy, but it's still um, uh, something that uh, asks all uh, the government agencies to notify uh, the commissioner and individuals if you know, uh, if there's a privacy breach. So even though the law uh, doesn't have that requirement, there's still a policy that, um, you know, organization have to or should or shall <laughs> follow. Uh, and I went on the CRA website just to see, you know, do they have a statement regarding privacy breaches and stuff like that? And they do. And if I may, I I'm going to read you uh, um, a short sentence, but they say that uh, our employees have to report any detected or suspected unauthorized access or disclosure of information, disconduct or fraud, and any uh, uh, processes that appear to be vulnerable to fraud. Uh, and they say that if we confirm a privacy breach, we act quickly to deal with the incident. If a breach is deemed a material, we inform any affected individuals and the officer and the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. So the CRA uh, do have that statement that they're going to notify uh, people. So Okay, so this reminds me of, you know, when you go on like a company website and they're like, our values is that we're family and we love innovation. And then when you start working there, it's not nothing like that. Is that the is that possible for people to write about, you know, these policies about cybersecurity and all that stuff on their website, but then not follow through with it? And if so, is there any repercussions for them? I mean, everything is possible, right? <laughs> then you have to think, is it ethical first? I think that's something that we should keep in mind. And what I see, you know, when I'm working with clients is that sometimes it's not that like companies or federal agencies don't want to um, notify individual of or give that information. The thing is that sometimes it takes uh, days, weeks to really know, you know, what is the breach, uh, what kind of data that was breached, etc. So it takes time. Uh, but I get it. And, you know, when you're the individual, you're frustrated, right? Uh, so sometimes that's also what we're seeing is that it takes time for the company to notify, uh, you know, if there has, has been a breach, what was done, etc. So I don't think that from what I'm seeing, most companies want to do good. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to do their best, uh, but there's still like awareness uh, that we need to do. Um, sometimes it's regarding like budgets, you know, funds. They don't have enough resources. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for asking my follow-up question. My next one is for David Leonard. So based on how the CRA, the CRA reacted, what are they liable for? And would they have to pay any fines? So with respect to that one, one, we clearly see that personal information has been affected. Um, and I'll speak to in terms of overall, as an information taker and holder, you're responsible from that standpoint. So there could be, uh, if there is any regulatory fines and penalties that develop out of that uh, current scenario, yes, they would be liable from that standpoint. At the same time, um, they have my personal information. If I suffer any damages, then essentially I could file suit. A lot of the times you would see that it could come in from a class action suit. Uh, but we have various different uh, scenarios on that particular case. But speaking to how the insurance policies there to respond for organizations, 
One is really to try and get ahead of that case. And I think that's why you see organizations, one, really be uh, mindful of how they communicate uh, from that standpoint. So going back to the first crisis management, one, the important is um, the actual uh, legal aspect. So determine what you're liable for. The second portion is, you know, getting the crisis in, in managed. The other element would be with respect to that notifying. So that cost there is to engage with the firm that's responsible for notifying. Uh, that's why if, if we started to receive, you know, notifications left, right, and center, of, you know, if you went to Home Depot, for instance, there you would have, or if you're a member of Desjardins, uh, for that to receive notification. And then they would start offering, you know, an element of credit monitoring for, you know, X amount of period of time, or in some cases unlimited. Again, these are all aspects that are covered by the insurance policy uh, to reduce that aspect of, you know, one, from a reputation standpoint. So we don't want to start losing clients based on that we have had a breach, but also two, to kind of mitigate that aspect that, you know, we don't have these kind of class action suits, suits developed. And again, it becomes very difficult also to prove damages in that particular case. Um, but again, the idea is that if you had uh, incurred any damages on account that I, I would, uh, someone as an information holder had my personal information, I then suffered a credit risk, uh, then that essentially those could be recoverable uh, from a claim standpoint. Thank you for that. I do have a question from an attendee. Will any fines get passed back to the taxpayers as a refund? Big smiley face. <laughs> I don't think anyone can answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think anybody wants to. Okay, well, with that, thank you, Peter. Oh, no, this was Paul. Yes, thank you, Paul, for your question and your big smiley face. I appreciate it. So with that... Uh, let's move on to Colonial Pipeline oil attack. I think this one's super, super interesting. Uh, so five facts, just so that we're all on the same page. So this year, the Colonial Pipeline in the USA was rocked by a major ransomware attack with a 5,500 mile long pipeline that travels over 1 million gallons of gasoline from state to state. It instantly closed due to the impact of the attack. A reported 100 gigabytes of data were exfiltrated and locked down from the Colonial Pipeline IT network, leaving the company without the ability to operate key systems that transport fuel. The attack was raced back to a single VPN login. The credentials appeared in a dark web password leak. The login was apparently outdated. And $4.4 million was paid to the cyber hackers. So my first question is for Louis. My question to you is, this was considered an attack on critical infrastructure in the US, given the scale of the attack and impact it had on society. It begs the question, was this an attack to retrieve data, shut down operations causing potential chaos or both? That's a tough question, Laura. Uh, well, okay, so I mean, for me, when I, when I see an attack of this nature, what I look at is, little effort for huge impact okay so i think the impact i, I i'd like to kind of maybe spin, spin the question a little bit and say well what was the impact right i, I think the retrieving of the data obviously there, there's important data critical data in there but i think shutting down operations as critical as colonial was demonstrates the impact uh, on society to utility Right. If a utility is impacted, whether it's going to be hydroelectric, whether it's going to be a, a train, you know, railroad, railroad, railroad provider, um, I, I think that to me is the smallest amount of effort for the biggest impact. And frankly, your, you know, four point four million dollars was paid. We, you know, in, in the cybersecurity space, and I'm, I'm sure Julien and then the others will, will will attest, especially is never pay the ransom, right? But I think given the fact that they were able to shut down the pipelines rapidly without no you know real strategy to turn things back up quickly that was going to be you know little effort for big impact 
Um, one thing that I do want to mention here is that we're this is this is a very really, uh, unique world when we talk about you know the pipeline organizations. When we talk about utilities in general. They're dealing with not only IT but OT, operational technology and information technology, and those two worlds really never talk to each other. The OT world was a kind of rock solid in the past, but now the OT is bridging itself into the IT world, which is making this huge exposure now. And that's the issue right there. So this OT technology, which has been running for years, right? I know David's nodding his head because he's seen that often, right? Um, the OT was kind of like rock solid. You would never worry about it. But now OT is blending into IT. And this is where it's going to be a huge impact to not only, I mean, Colonial is just, you know, a tip of the iceberg. We saw JM, JBS meets, I believe, the last couple of weeks. Um, and I worry. I worry, frankly, when it comes time to these types of organizations. So to answer Thank your question, you. was it was it data or was it uh, chaos? I, I would go for the latter, chaos and, and quick quick uh, quick benefit. Thank you for that answer. That was awesome. No um, also, just a reminder: if anyone has any questions, to let us know. My next question is for Julien. Excited, Julien? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, why do Many companies? <laughs> Why do companies still have a reluctance to use MFA solutions? Like why? Yeah, well, I think we touched this a little bit in the previous discussion. Um, the, the problem is, is when you have to do one, one step, one, one more step, let's say, for everyone. The adoption is so important. And we didn't talk about that earlier, but the password less would be a way better solution. So there's a lot of companies working on that kind of looking on your behavior around the keyboard and mouse and stuff like that. And this is stuff that is coming, although it's not quite ready. But the problem is the reluctance is, is, is in like, I already have to open three emails and click here and do that. So 2FA is kind of a burden, so I won't do it. And it, it's, it's always between uh, the back of the computer, you know, that, that the problem is it's, it's the user, the, the person that is using the computer the technology so we have to make this easy and it's the same reason like we say why does people still click on stuff that they shouldn't right it, it's it's not normal and and interesting fact um four percent four percent of the whole company will click on anything even if it's written don't click here you're going to have some problem well they still click on it and you know why the reason is the internet and everything is built towards clicking. You need to click to open, click for next, click for this, click to download, click here. And all of a sudden we say, don't click here, do not click there. So it's just an instinct to, to click everywhere, you know? So people will click everywhere all the time. And then 97% of all the breaches that we saw in the past year came from a phishing. So people are clicking everywhere. And yes, if 2FA was um, uh, activated or, or, or deployed, we wouldn't have, have any breach probably. So I think at the end of the day is we need to make security easy. We need to make sure that not that we avoid uh, the user, we need to have him part of the solution because cybersecurity is not a product. It's not something that you acquire and you're done. It's, there's no silver bullet. We, we said that in the past, everyone said, just acquire my technology and you'll be good. No, you won't because it's a process. It's a journey. It's stuff that you need to do awareness. You need, we need to do what we're doing today, just talking about it and explaining what, what's happening out there. So um, we need to make this easy. We need to let people click everywhere. And that's okay because, you know, when, when you open the water, you have clean water, right? When you open the internet, we should have clean internet. And it's not the fact today, right? It should and it will one day. It's it's like you know I'm I'm a purist in cybersecurity, so that's the goal and the vision I'm trying to you know at, at one point arrive. But un until that moment, we're like you know trying to do as as much as we can, the best we can, and and we have job to do, and and having two FA and all that stuff is a burden. So as long as this will be a burden, we will still have people reluctant installing those. Uh, technology that is not sophisticated at all. It's just, you know, a, a second authentication. That's it. You password, text, oh, boom, you're done. But then, oh, it's not easy. We need to. So I think that's, that's where the problem is. It needs to be easy for the adoption. I love that message. Just make security easy. 
Love it. So shifting gears here, this question is for David Millet. Will these attacks propel zero trust architecture to the forefront? A good question. Um, so I guess before saying if it'll be propelled to the forefront or not, we should maybe explain a little bit what that is. Um, the, the notion of zero trust is, is about like, like a bit like Julian was saying, you know, we have this idea of there's a password and, or, or a multi-factor authentication and then boom, you're in, right? And then you're in and you do your day's work. And, you know, you can do whatever you got to do because you're in. The, the, the zero trust factor is basically don't trust anything. You know, one system doesn't necessarily trust another. Uh, even, you know, there could be a man in the middle, you know, sniffing traffic in the middle. So make sure that all communication between systems are encrypted. Make sure that your people are properly trained and vetted and monitored as far as the types of activities and what they're doing, clicking on. So you have an audit trail of these types of things. Um, you know, make sure like it's basically securing the individuals, right? So through passwords and multi-factor authentication, but also securing the system to system communications. And also, for example, like, you know, when we go in to do operations and, and um, I guess, high risk environments, this started up, uh, you know, within organizations like CRA, like DND, uh, where when you go work in these organizations, it's literally drop all your stuff in the front, you're escorted to the room that you work in, you work, and then you're, you're picked up and you're walked out at the end. You got to go to the bathroom, same thing. Everybody shut down their laptop, you're walked out <laughs> through them because they, they minimize the risk. So this is like an extreme level of that, right? But, you know, there are organizations right now, most organizations that we do work in where we're deploying a new server, one example is we don't use our generic credential, right, to do actions on that server. We got to go get a unique use password tied to our user, right? That's only unlocked for one specific machine for a period of time that allows us access to do the work that we do, which is audited. So we're deploying a patch or whatever, we reboot, and then that password is gone and no longer usable. So it's about providing the minimal amount of access to individuals to allow them to efficiently do the work that they need to do um, and not more. So the whole superpower user password that lets you do everything, that holy, you know, magic wand that let you that that's a thing of the past because that's that's a high risk element, right? So um, it's always so it's always um, the notion of assessing, reassessing, and adapting those those elements. Like for example, the the problem that we had with regards to the expired password, right, that was used to get into the system, right, an old expired password to a VPN that was no longer in use was used. They crippled the whole environment. Well, if you had policies in place that said if password is not used for X amount of time, it expires, right? Because it hadn't been used for a long time, it could have automatically been locked or expired. Or if multi-factor authentication was in place, that would have been literally blocked, right? Um, or if for whatever means they did manage to get in, if you had multiple gates and doors throughout the process to get to where they wanted to, it would have probably been blocked before that, right? So um, I would say yes, most organizations um, are taking on a policy of whether it's small, medium or large, I think we all need to look at security and quality, the way that we approach, you know, uh, you know uh, defending against these things, you know, in relation to the risk. Because naturally, if, you're, if your business is generating $200,000 of revenue a year, you're not going to spend $500,000 to secure it, right? You got you to put it in relation to the risk factor, to what you have to lose, to the, to the types of customers that you have and what's demanded from that perspective. But having a, a chief security officer who, who is nominated, who has experience for working with firms, uh, you know, that can provide expertise like us, like the people that you have over here that can help give you guidance to lock down certain things, and have policies of what, what happens when things happen and how do you deal with that and do you have appropriate backups to recover if whatever <laughs> impact your systems get totally encrypted and you don't have access to them so you don't have to pay the ransom and you can get yourself out of that these are all uh, things that are um, the new reality right i mean the same way that you know certain people have you know a, a security system on their door and you know certain people you know, you know we have to have the right policies in place to defend against it. If not, you're, you're making yourself a viable target for the, for the hackers to get in. If you make it difficult for them, chances are they're going to go look somewhere else because there's a lot of easier targets out there. So many great points. Um, I wanted to get into it, but we actually have questions from the attendees. We have two of them. One of them is a little bit more general, so um, I'm just going to read it out loud. Great insight as it relates to these big organizations. What would you recommend for small businesses to protect themselves and client data? 
top three recommendations. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And we will start with David Millet because you were already on a roll there. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, you know, small, medium business. So if you're a small organization, right, uh, definitely multi-factor authentication for everything that you have is a must. Uh, second is ensure that you have off-site backups, right? So take something that's, that's on a, an external detached disk, even have duplicates of that backup if possible, right? But take an encrypted backup of what you have in case somebody does get in and basically encrypts your whole operation, you don't end up going under, right? So there's a lot of examples. In fact, uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, I've talked with a couple of organizations that are, you wouldn't think of them as, as key targets. One of them is the company that delivers propane to our to our house. Uh, we live in the country, we have a farm area, and um, you know we have a big propane tank, and for like a month, they didn't show up. I mean, they're calling them. They said, yeah, because we, we had all of our systems encrypted. One of, you know, we are a conglomerate of a bunch of them, and one of them had, a zero day attack on something, a patch that wasn't deployed and lo and behold, they got in and the whole thing was encrypted. And now they're, they're enabled to operate because they don't know where or when they're supposed to, to be or go. So, um, you know, you don't need to be big to be a victim of this, but if they had a backup of the system that was un- that they could unencrypt and bring up onto an alternate system, um, that's very beneficial. But the second thing I would say is you can rely on certain, um, you know, big players in the industry. So like, you know, a lot of people, are, you know, uh, there's still this notion of having physical servers for your web server and things like that hosted in areas. More and more, this, this cloud-enabled environment allows you to have real-time backups. In fact, you know, all of our infrastructure is hosted within a, a major cloud provider, and that's backed up uh, you know, on, on the hourly basis. So if something ever did happen, we can recover all of our exchange uh, emails and, and, and uh, server elements and customer data and so forth, right? So there, there's that, that that's a factor. And these things don't necessarily cost a whole lot. Like our whole web infrastructure backup for a, for a daily backup costs us $5 a month. So that's not a, a crazy investment even in your small organization. Work with experts. Have the, have the experts come in and do pen tests against your system. I mean, they can uncover a lot of really, really good things, like small things that are easy tweaks to fix, like changing the, the address of how they access your admin area, making it something that's unknown so that they can't even get to that login page so that they do brute force attacks and trying to enter a bunch of passwords because they don't even know where to go to enter a password, right? So these are, these are you know, not necessarily big changes, but small changes that can have a big impact as far as securing yourself. And I would say the last thing, educate your people. Right. Um, regularly have sessions, have them join these types of sessions, send them false emails and see who's clicking on things. And then don't be angry with them. You know, understand that it's human nature and people need to learn things and then spend the time to to help them uh, understand things from that perspective. So that, that's what I would say to that. Amazing summary, David. And Louis summarized it, gave a, a few other recommendations. Anne Marie, if you want in the chat. Um, we do have another question, Paul. I see your question. I'm going to come back to it after. Okay, Julien, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I just um, everything David said um, is is hygiene. So basically, you know, you, when you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you wash your hair, you wash your hands. You know, so in IT, it's the same thing. So you patch your server, you change your password. You make sure you you do your backup. This is like basic one on one. It's it's always the same thing. Even when when you play sports, it's always the basic that works. So it's the same thing with IT. So just basic IG is is what I wanted to say. I love that. Good summary, Junier. Um, I just want to come back to Colonial Pipeline. I just have two more questions, and then Paul, we're gonna go to Solar Winds. So my next question is for Vanessa. Now for the Colonial Pipeline, just a reminder: everything kind of shut down. <laughs> that was a great summary, Laura. So Colonial, uh, they face like client data being stolen. They have a lot of lost revenue, suppliers, clients being mad. Is this, um, can they, can there be lawsuits against them because of all this stuff? I mean, for sure. But then what's difficult, at least in Canada, is how are you going to prove that there's um uh, how can I say that, that there's a... Um, Are you trying to say like a malicious intent? Not necessarily a malicious intent, but the way, uh, if there's a lawsuit, you need to prove that there's like a real damage. 
And regarding privacy, like personal information, how can you prove that the fact that someone uh, had access to your data, to your personal information, that you as an individual have a damage because of that? You know what I mean? So usually that's the reason why there's going to be lawsuits, uh, but they're dismissed just because you can prove that there's a real damage uh, to you as an individual. So that's, I would say, the, the, the problem uh, that we have, the way the, the, the laws are written. Okay, good to know. And just out of curiosity, if a company would want to sue, they would also have to kind of prove that there was damage on their company. Exactly. And again, depending, you know, if there is agreement in place, if it's a breach of the agreement, uh, there could be also lawsuits according to that. So, OK, perfect. Thank you, Vanessa, for that. And my last question for Colonial is for David Leonard. Sorry for David Leonard. How are attacks like this one putting pressure on the insurance market? Yeah, so I think Colonial, uh, and there's been now some a few other major breaches, and I'll speak about uh, Solowin to, to kind of roll that into it. But just going back, I think to help close the loop in terms of uh, in terms of how we looked at it, Luigi brought up the idea, the concept between IoT versus IT, the lack of understanding of what security means for both those two worlds and how they collide. I think that's an element that comes down to the idea of the NESA with respect to policy compliance. And then coming down to how do we get that and integrate that into building, which I do like to comment in terms of the hygiene. I always looked at it as being a security culture and it comes down to really relying on the tools that are there, but they're not always great or they're not always, they, you know, at the end, human error is one of the main causes of these breaches. And I think that's what really comes down to is that, you know, having a, a culture and hygiene across an organization and that security does fall within each of these categories. And that's how kind of the idea that comes when we look at insurance, that what is the role of an insurance standpoint from that? I think it helps tie the loop because it falls, usually it falls within to, you know, that's the controller's role or the CFO, that's what he looks at. But at the end of the day, you know, the insurance piece on the cyber perspective when looking at security and when, what is the decision on what, at what point do we want to transfer that risk over to someone else, be it from a balance sheet protection aspect or from an operational standpoint, what, you know, you're about, uh, from a financial, what can be held and, and maintained from that perspective. I think that there is kind of what closes the gap and that's how insurance has come into a world of understanding what security is. And that's where we've seen now the evolution of these coverages and the breadth of coverage. Historically, it was really kind of bound to, you know, the aspect of liability and then, you know, the competitiveness in the market that we saw extensions of cover. So, you know, covering all the direct damages, you know, loss of revenue, uh, the payment of these extortions. Um, what happens if I knock down my own uh, servers by accident? You know, I thought I was in a sandbox. I now I have a loss of revenue. That would be insurable on these extensions. The reliance now on third-party vendors. What happens if SolarWinds has a breach, causes my system to go down? You know, loss of revenue from that standpoint. So we've seen that very kind of systemic aspect and, you know, very open markets to, to really competitiveness. Now we start seeing very tightening aspects and that's having an impact one on the amount of uh, ransoms that are actually getting paid. Uh, we're probably seeing now on average about $220,000 per claim or per actual payment that gets paid. You know, that involves small, medium and, uh, enterprises, but we do see some now pretty large and sizable figures that actually do get paid out or actually demanded or negotiated. But now we start seeing that markets are going to start tightening that aspect. And the idea is that we're not going to start, uh, you know, avoid having to cover these under an insurance standpoint. And, you know, which requires that everyone kind of agrees that we got to stop paying these things. Um, but that requires that uh, every organization, you know, doesn't slip away and say, oh, I paid it. I had to. Uh, but we do see that evolution in terms of a systemic issue from across the board uh, in terms of these damages. And, and I think Solar Ones was one that, uh, it did touch home on certain carriers um, in terms of when they look at their portfolio of insurance, uh, their clients and their exposure. And now what we see is that when reevaluating that aspect from a large sale, we see that the reinsurance market tightening on insurance rates there, that gets translated down to the insurance carriers. And now that's coming down to seeing uh, what we see at actual clients paying in terms of premiums. Again, I think it's still relatively cheap product. Uh, 
uh, but I think it requires a good understanding of what their each individual aspect of what their exposure is. And you know, if you're not doing certain tools, maybe the insurance maybe not be the right decision right away. You know, if you're not doing the MFA, maybe it's do the MFA and then maybe source out uh, uh, to look at transferring the risk. But that's what we're starting to see in terms of globally, in terms of the aspect there is that uh, ransomware and the systemic aspect are really becoming the question and really applying a fair amount of pressure on, on the insurance market. Thank you, David. That was awesome. Um, I'm just going to ask the question about solar winds because Paul wants to know your opinion about something. So I'm just going to leave the floor open to whoever wants to respond. He says that solar winds show that monitoring applications, processes, and devices, which is considered zero trust, still does not protect attackers. Um, uh, still does not protect attackers were freely operating with valid credentials and performing no unusual activities. What are your thoughts on how attacks like these can be detected? Julien, Julien, and then we're going to do David Millet. Okay, Julien is excited. <laughs> yeah, I like that question because it's exactly where where we're going in terms of of cybersecurity. So the the the, the answer is humans plus technology together, plus proactive threat hunting. And, and the definition of threat hunting is taking like, um, in, like breach assumption, we will act like if the client was breached to protect them, seeking for IOC, IOA, indicator of compromission and indicator of attack. So by doing 24 seven proactive threat hunting, we can stop that kind of attack. Why? Because humans will be able to see the difference between behavior, uh, normal behavior and abnormal behavior, because we know that the, the attacker, the adversary, they're using um, software that is legit in a computer to do illegal stuff with it. So that's normal that most of the technology don't see what's happening because it's all legit <laughs> software being used. So um, yeah, uh, proactive threat hunting, which is all fall under the umbrella of managed detection and response, which is the actual buzzword, but um, it's, it's not something new. It's just uh, services, platform, agent, device, human, and knowledge all together in one big, uh, not solution, but a process of protecting um, an enterprise, I think. A hexagon of security, right? Whoa, awesome. we're creating things yeah. here together, guys. <laughs> so David Millet, you also wanted to add? Yeah, I wanted to just say that um, it's evident that it's impossible to, to predict, you know, all of the ways that attackers are going to try to get in. Um, you know, as, as we evolve defenses, they evolve new ways to attack and new ways to, to penetrate into your organization. And, you know, sometimes it's as basic as leveraging the weakness of an individual that they, that they get outside of your organization through a debt that they have or something, and they leverage that to get to that individual, right? So it's not always as easy as, as setting up all the boundaries, but naturally, if you've segregated the access within your system so that each individual is only limited to the work that they can do, then they've got to get to the right individuals, right, to be able to get access to the type of data that they want. So protecting the data, ensuring that when, you know, how data leaves your, your system, how it's audited when it leaves the disk, you know, the system and so forth, these are, these are all super important, um, you know, and, um, and um, using, you know, using uh, analytics to a certain degree on, on predictive behavior of your individuals, right? So this is something that's coming up more and more in the technology. As Janae, you probably see this as well, this notion of saying, you know what, this, this, user, this user comes in from nine to five and he typically does this type of work within these systems. If all of a sudden you notice that he's going into alternate systems or doing different things, this should be flagged to your security team, right? It doesn't mean that it's wrong. He maybe has a new assignment or a new role but that's, that's reason for you to look at why has the behavior changed? Like, why is he coming in, you know, it's seven o'clock in the morning now and he used to, you know, for the past year and a half, he's always came in a certain time. Why has, so these are, these are where it's important to sort of understand the behavior because often there's these types of threats that come from those areas as well, right? We can secure the systems all that we want. There are uh, individuals that are part of our, our organization and their realities 
um, you know, can change, right? I mean, even if you've done background checks to all your employees and everything was great and financials are great and everything was good, it doesn't mean that, you know, a year later that that sustains itself. They could have developed some form of a problem and, uh, or, or a frustration against your organization that you're not even aware of because their boss has been, you know, awful with them for some reason and then maliciously want to do something, right? So I'm just saying that it's not, it's not easy, right? But it, it requires vigilance and it requires you to, um, and, you know, yes, do all those right things, like all the hygiene elements that Janine was mentioning, the, you know, the backing up of your systems and the, you know, patching of those systems and, and, and whatnot and education your teams. But there's that additional layer where, you know, don't think that because you've done that, that you can close your eyes and everything's just going to happen, right? I mean, you're, you're now totally protected and walking around in an armor. You are much more protected, but you still need to be vigilant, right? So. I love that. It's just things change and we have to keep up with them. Simple, yeah. but so true. And I also want to highlight what Vanessa, our pan- panelist, said in the chat is that, remember, it's not about if a company will get attacked, but when they will be attacked. So everyone who's here, thank you so much. Thank you for all the attendees. I am going to pass the stage to Louis because he does still have the tablet. So yeah, I got to give away the tablet, guys. And, so we got to and... give it away. But I just want to so... say thank you from my end. All the panelists, you, everybody who asked a question, love this. This was so fun. Thank you, Laura. Laura, you're going to have to make me share my screen because I've got a little dilemma. The, 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 the team kind of put two names in now, so I got to spin a wheel so someone wins. So you're going to have to make me share my screen here so I can do this in full transparency. So funny that we're talking about technology and here I am struggling with it. How do I share? Oh, change. No. If not, I can just I randomly do it and you'll have to believe me. Yeah, do it. We'll listen for it because I can't figure okay. this out. Oh, that work is not really a demo. No, no. Okay. Well, I'm just basically, ran- so two names were chosen in the end. So I'm going to have to shuffle the wheel here or spin the wheel. Can't shuffle the wheel. You can only spin it. And the winner is Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, woo woo. There we go. You and the tablet, we will contact you within the next two days, today, tomorrow, maybe Monday. Uh, But congratulations. Uh, Thank you for attending. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the time here, guys. It was awesome. Thank you, everyone, so much. And uh, be safe, everybody. Thank you. Take care, guys. (laughs) Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.